So today we're going to talk about the Cook-Levin theorem. And we'll, I guess, sort of talk about its proof, but we're going to talk about how it can be better, like a better Cook-Levin theorem. So what is a Cook-Levin theorem? Again, I hope you've seen it before. Here's how it's normally stated. Well, it's, that's sad, it's NP-hard. That's the theorem. Let's uh, expand on this a little bit to remind you what the terminology means. Uh, in other words, um, let L be a language that's in NP. I'll write it as in n time T of n, where T of n is polynomial. Then, uh, what does it mean? It means that L reduces in polynomial time to set. So set is like the hardest language in NP, or it's harder than anything in NP. And what does that reduction mean? It means there exists a poly n time algorithm R uh, that maps you know, a string x to a sat formula phi of x such that well, the reduction property is so that x is in L, then only if phi x is in sat. Okay, that's what it means for sat to be NP-hard. As you can see, it's about the existence of an algorithm, R, that has some properties. And uh, this is good. Uh, actually, let me be slightly better to write it like this. This is good, but you know, we can always make it better. I mean, in particular, better from like an algorithmic point of view. I mean, just to say that you have like a polynomial time algorithm that does something is fine, but um, we could ask for something stronger. In fact, there's three questions that I want to ask about this theorem, maybe four actually, uh, in terms of like how we can make it potentially better. One is uh, a little bit, again, technical, but um, it's useful, as we'll see later in the class, to bring it up. And uh, it concerns this point when we refer to n time. Um, in what model of computation? So n time in what model? Well, you might say, didn't we decide that our model of computation is multi-tape Turing machines? Like, why are you asking this question? Well, it's um, useful in life sometimes to consider uh, other models. Like, um, we don't want to go really down in power to one-tape Turing machines. But like, a nice model is random access machines or random access Turing machines where like, you don't so much have tapes. as like you have memory, and you can like, indirectly access it by writing the position in memory, that's closer to computation. Like we like to design our algorithms in, in this model. And perhaps it could make a difference. Like it's, it's a more powerful model RAMs than Turing machines. So like it would be even better if you could get this theorem not just for languages and non-deterministic time, T of n on Turing machines, but also on RAMs. That would make this theorem better if you could prove that. Now you might say, yeah, but OK, one thing that I know is that like all the reasonable models can simulate each other with polynomial slowdown. I mean, it's true that you know, RAMs are kind of more powerful than Turing machines, but not by more than polynomial time. So like, actually, we obviously have this exact theorem also for, let's say, the RAM model, because it's just polynomial slowdown. Aha, but that brings us to question two, which is that we're going to start to really care about efficiency a lot. And that's right there in the title. We're going to care about not just polynomial time, but quasi-linear time. So question two here is, OK, um, can this algorithm not just be polynomial time, but quasi-linear time. And uh, I'll say a couple more words about exactly what I mean but um, in a second. But let me start a little bit with motivation. I mean, why should we care? Quasi-polynomial, by the way, means like, uh, quasi-linear, by the way, means almost linear. Linear times polylog. And one reason that we care, like genuinely, is you know, polynomial time is mathematically convenient, and like we kind of roughly equate it with efficiency in life, but like that's not so accurate. Uh, you know, an n to the 100 time algorithm is not really efficient. In fact, honestly, an n squared time algorithm is not really efficient in real life either. I mean, you know, n equals a billion is like a nice plausible number, but like a billion squared is too many operations. Uh, 
So you know the the things that like really actually correspond to truly efficient algorithms, I think, is like quasi-linear time, you know, n times log n, n times log squared n, something like that. That's actually closer to truly algorithmic, uh, true algorithmic efficiency. So as algorithmic designers, you might strive towards that. And, you know, complexity theory is just algorithms in reverse or something. Um, you know, and like the, this is about the existence of efficient algorithms. So we should try to really make it efficient. There's some um, theoretical motivation for wanting quasi-linear time too, as we'll see. Uh, but let's, this is what we're going to talk about. Can R be quasi-linear time? One question is actually, what does this uh, quite mean? Are we talking that it should run in time n times poly log n? Yeah, that's fine. That's what we would mean uh, in this situation. But uh, Actually, that's not what we would mean in this situation necessarily. There's kind of a problem that that's not quite what we, we would mean. And the reason is, let's imagine a little bit in our heads like what's actually going on under the hood in this theorem. We're going to come back to it. But basically, let's say, you know, L is, you know, a, a non-deterministic time n squared uh, machine. And then there's this reduction that converts like a question about whether x is an L to like a question about whether a certain formula is satisfiable. And the proof goes by like kind of making the computation tableau for this non-deterministic machine that runs at n squared time and then converting it to a sat formula or a circuit sat formula. Well, I mean, the, the computational tableau of this n squared time machine is going to be size. I mean, there's no way you can get it to be smaller than n squared. I mean, it's going to have to leave some information per time step of t. So like the output size of r, which is somehow representing the computation of this machine, it's got to be size at least for sure t of n. So um, really, you don't want necessarily quasi-linear time in the input size. It's not very fair. <laughs> it's impossible if you know, this mapping itself maps, you know, size n things to size n squared things. It should be quasi-linear in the output size. And like the, you know, the output size that we would truly strive for is to have like the size of the formula that's representing the computation be like close to t. So actually, what I mean, even here to like a, a better way to think about the Cook-Levin theorem is not so much to impose this, just forget that t of n is poly n. OK, maybe I'll just insist that it's at least n, because we never care about running times less than n. And this should be poly t of n time, or t of yeah, length of x time. In fact, uh, I don't say this just for fun. Um, at the end of the class, we're going to be talking, applying the Cook-Levin theorem to problems in NEXP, non-deterministic exponential time. So, you know, the R is going to run in exponential time. So it, it, uh, I'd like to keep T general, but then what it means is you would ideally hope for this to be T of n times polylog T of n. So that was a bit of a technical point, but any questions about it? Okay. Now, uh, this question too, I said there'd be three questions. It's because this question too kind of breaks down into two questions. Um, 2A is, let's actually first ask for something that's like a little bit less strong than this. Uh, this is like saying we want R to be super efficient, let's say quasi-linear time in the appropriate parameter. Now, if you're a quasi-linear time algorithm, you only have time to output quasi-linearly many bits. Okay? A, the converse is not necessarily true. So perhaps a, a weaker thing to hope for is, could we at least get that the length of the output is at most quasi-linear in the, the, you know, the parameter we're shooting for, which is t of x. even if maybe the algorithm itself takes a bit longer. So we'll, again, also see this later, but when you're doing um, reductions, like NP-completeness reductions, you know, usually at first you just say, well, it's polynomial time. But uh, that 
matters somewhat, but one parameter that matters a bit more than polynomial time is like the size of the blow up. Like if you take a, you know, an instance of this language of n bits, you know, do you map it to an n log n like string or do you map it to an n squared like string? That actually kind of matters more usually than the actual running time to produce the string. Um, and well, you'll see why uh, in a relatively short amount of time. But this is sometimes like, you know, enough for us just to say that the output is very, only slightly longer than the input in the reduction. Uh, okay. So um, now question 2B, this is like a little bit, you know, asking a little bit weaker question than this. 2B is going to be asking like an even stronger question. Um, you know, if so, can we make this R like super duper efficient? And uh, for example, what I mean by that is let R be poly log time. Let me not get. Uh, into the parameter. Well, what, the, what does this mean? So we're asking, like, here first I ask, you know, R be like very efficient, like you can compute it in quasi-linear time. Now I'm asking like this question that you have to even think about what it means. Can R be computable in polylog time? And what does that mean? We, it's very similar to what we talked about when we were talking about uniformity of circuits. It's like the output is some like, I don't know, poly-length or quasi-linear length string. To be able to compute it in polylog time is like, uh, to be able to say like, you supply me not just with the regular input, but with a coordinate i. And my task is to output the ith bit of the actual output. And let's say I have random access input to the real input x. OK, so like it's not just like you, know, you compute the whole output, output very efficiently. Like any single bit you can compute like hyper efficiently if you're told the name of the bit that you're trying to output. OK, so that's. Um, you know, a funny thing maybe to think about at first, but it turns out this is also uh, important. So for example, like, um, you know, let's say in like a classical thing where like L is, I don't know, the three coloring problem and you're reducing it to sat. So the reduction takes a graph and you're trying to know if it's three colorable and it outputs like a three sat formula. To say that, to ask yourself whether this R could be like super efficient and be like polylog time. You're looking for like an algorithm that like takes this input, the graph and a number J of like order log n bits and outputs the jth clause of the real reduction applied to the graph. Okay, and um, if you think about it, the, the textbook reduction from three coloring to three sat has this property because it's a very simple reduction. Okay, so these are some questions that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, as I said, they're all a bit technical, but um, it's like, it will be good for us at like several points in later in this course to know the answers to these questions, which is that like everything you want to be true is true. So like everything is true. So anything you know you might hope the answer would be over here is is true, and we'll perhaps at the end of this lecture we'll just remember that fact only, but today we'll have to talk a little bit about why it's true. Now before we get into it, I mean I talked about this a little bit so far, but like another question that might be on your mind is why am I really caring about this? I mean it seems, this is a pretty good theorem as is, you know, like why should we go crazy about it? Um, let me try to give you a few answers. So one answer is, I talked about it in words, but it's related to bullet point two over there. Um, just that, you know, arguably, and several people have argued this, and I myself might argue it, uh, you know, truly efficient in terms of algorithms is better, I think, associated to class quasi-linear time than to P. This is union of time n log to the C n. Yeah, you can really be like, oh, but this fits like a running time n times log to the 1,000 n. Like, is that efficient? But like, come on, at least it's better than p. Um, so we may want to uh, think about that. 
And uh, the fact that the answer to question two turns out to be yes uh, means that, in fact, uh, sat is uh, Q Linhard. I don't want to fully define this, but in the sense that like every, um, every problem that can be solvable uh, in quasi-linear time non-deterministically can has a, like a quasi-linear reduction to sat. And in particular, like if you want to, like why do we care that sat is NP complete? You know, often we say it's because, oh, if, if uh, you know, my favorite NP problem is in polynomial time, then, sorry, if sat is in polynomial time, then all my favorite NP problems are in polynomial time. And uh, similarly, um, you know, this implies that like, uh, um, uh, any problem in non-deterministic quasi-linear time is in deterministic quasi-linear time if sat is. Okay, so you know this is like the same kind of conclusion with like a different notion of what is truly efficient quasi-linear. I'll make some more comments about this on a second, but. Um, let me say a couple of things. First of all, you know, uh, sat is quasi-linear hard. It'd be nicer to say complete here. And that's true. Uh, so the, the missing piece to show that is to show that sat actually is solvable in quasi-linear time with non-determinism. Yeah, so sat should be there as well, right? Where, where? Like sat is and Oh, yeah, sorry, this should be. That's confusing, thank you. Uh, so is that true? That's true, actually. Although you have to think about it for like one minute. Like, let me call this an exercise. Because, um, well, I'll talk about the answer. Okay, how do you solve sat in, uh, with non-determinism? You're just like, well, I guess the satisfying assignment. Let me even put three sat here, just for simplicity. I guess the satisfying assignment, and then I check it. Okay, the guessing the satisfying assignment is definitely linear time. You just write down n bits. Okay. Uh, how do you check it? Well, you're like, I don't know, you go through all the clauses, plug in what you checked, and then see if you get all trues. Well, that's definitely easy if you have a random access machine. You know, you're going along the clauses and you're like, okay, I gotta check whether my assignment satisfies X7 or X50 or not X100. Okay, so then you have to like go look up into your like string of guess bits, like X50, X100, and whatever. Again, no problem if you have like a random access machine. But our normal machine is Turing machine, our model is Turing machine, so can we do it? In quasi linear time? How would you do it? You could do some sort of binary search on the input tape to search for the. The well, binary search really needs like RAMs, right? Like if you like want to jump to like the end of an array, like you need to. But like if we're reading like the, the bits of the, the, the input that you require, we could like use that. Uh, if you know, if, if we like fix the length of the, of the bits or something, you could like know that we have to jump something, or, I don't know, something like that. So, yeah, that's the kind of thing that like RAMs are good for, but. Turing machines are not, like, it's a little bit annoying. You're like, oh, I have to think about machine models, but if you care about quasi-linear time, you do. Uh, what you need to do is um, sort. You need to, like, sort the uh, variables appearing in the clauses so that you can just, like, you need to, like, sort of, you want to take your, like, guest bits and, like, write them on top of the clauses. And so if you, like, sort the clauses, so the variables appear in order. I mean, this is why it's an exercise. I don't want to fully say it. But then, like, if you have, like, the, all the variables appearing in your instance, like, written in order with multiplicities, plus, like, you remember what, where they're coming from, then you can, like, make a parallel pass through the bits you guessed and the variables and, like, copy the values in and then, like, unsort. Okay. You have to think about it, right, for a few minutes. And then you have to say, wait, can I sort in? Uh, uh, you know, quasi-linear time. Normally, we're like, yeah, you can. Okay, that's okay. Like, think. Of, this is another part of component of the exercise. Like, think about it for a few minutes. Like, it's okay. You can do like merge sorts on like a multi-tape Turing machine in quasi-linear time. 
Okay, so that's why it's an exercise. <laughs> Uh, but it is. And in fact, uh, here's another fact, uh, well, sort of statement. Um, What's the the number of clauses is uh, Yeah, okay, so then it's like, yeah, that's an also annoying. You have to say, oh, is it, uh, you have to actually check that it's quasi linear time in the size of the input rather than the number of variables. And that's, I guess, what, what you really are doing. It's like, okay, this, it could have more than a linear number of clauses, but then, you know, you're, the sorting takes time that's like quasi linear in the number of clauses. It's actually like all, I'll put a question mark here for safety, like natural. Okay, many, I don't know, many natural uh, NP complete problems. You know, all your favorite textbook ones are in non-deterministic quasi-linear time. Okay, so you might want to think about why that's true for, I don't know, like three coloring and uh, let me just erase complete, so I'll write graph isomorphism. That takes a little bit of thought. I don't know, independent set, et cetera. Uh, OK, so as I said, as a consequence of that, like, you know, 3SAT is complete for this class, non-deterministic quasi-linear time. And that means that, like, all of these problems have like a very efficient deterministic algorithm, a quasi-linear time deterministic algorithm, if and only if 3SAT does. Okay, that's an okay statement. It's good to know, although it's a little bit slightly vacuous in the sense that like the premise is highly unbelievable that like all like, even the premise that like 3SAT has a quasi-linear time deterministic algorithm is very unlikely. Um, but you can get like a, uh, an equivalent, another statement that's like more likely to impact our life or like for us to care about by thinking about it from another direction. Another consequence of that is, um, of this, is that, um, let's say 3SAT uh, not being in time 2 to the n to the 1 minus epsilon for any epsilon implies that, um, or I can just say equivalently to any of these problems, uh, I don't know, like any of these problems, I don't know, three coloring, not in time, two to the n to the one minus epsilon, or even equivalently like, you know, n time, nql, uh, being a subset of this. Um, Right, and this is more like a question that we're very interested in. This is like a variant of the so-called exponential time hypothesis. You know, it's a very interesting question. You know, can you do sat at 3 sat in time 2 to the n to the 0.99? That's unknown. Um, most people believe no, but we're not sure. And if you know that this is not true, then you get some very interesting conclusions about like, you know, hard... You know, you can show that natural problems in P, like, I don't know, computing the edit distance, require quadratic time. Um, so there's a lot of work these days on assuming, like, a statement like this and deriving cool consequences. And so you see, if you want to compare, you know, that's just 3SAT, if you want to think about another natural problem like 3 coloring or independent set or anything in non-deterministic quasi-linear time, uh, these statements are equivalent because the blow up in the reduction is like quasi-linear. So like the n parameter changes to like n times poly log n when you go between the problems. And so that's an illustration of why like 2a is like kind of important. You know, you don't mind so much that the reduction's time is polynomial and the time could be even like 2 to the n to the 0.5. It wouldn't bother you. But the thing that you really care about is like how much does the n parameter blow up? Okay, and so to make like this kind of precise relationship, you need that like the reduction between these problems doesn't increase n to like n to the 1.1. That would be bad. Okay, that was a little bit technical, um, but it's good to know. So that's why people really, that's the main reason why people care a lot about the fact that like SAT is like non-deterministic quasi-linear time complete. Um, here's a motivation for what, 2B. 2B looked also like very technical, like, whoa, we want these like super efficient reductions that like 
run in polylog time. And the mentality to have uh, here is that um, this is really polylog and like t of n time. The, the mentality to have here is like maybe you're concerned about the Cook-Levin theorem where this t of n time is exponential like 2 to the n. Um, and uh, in that case, polylog time is like polynomial time. So we'll see why, we'll see this at the end of the class, but an application of 2b is that a certain problem called succinct set is complete for the complexity class NEXP. Okay, NEXP is a useful class, even though it's quite large. And it's very nice to have like a natural complete problem for it called succinct set. I'll explain why this is true and what it means uh, later in the class, but what is this briefly, uh, this problem, you're given a circuit CN, and the question is, is uh, the truth table of this circuit in set? This is a string of length 2 to the n, if CN has n inputs. Okay, so it's sort of like you're given an implicitly defined Boolean formula. You want to know if it's satisfiable, and it's implicitly defined in the sense that you have an efficient algorithm that takes like the index of a bit into the formula's description and outputs what that bit is. Uh, okay, and this, to prove this, really needs to be, but it's a good thing to know. Uh, let me give one more. I'm still working on answering the motivation questions. So let me mention two, uh, well, one result, which we'll partially prove later in this course, which is a really cool result. It's based on some line of research initiated by Fortnow and maybe ending with Williams or Williams and Boss from 07. This was a guy, he did this work as part of his CMU PhD thesis. Uh, it shows this, Williams showed this. Any um, SAT algorithm, any algorithm solving SAT using uh, not very much space, n to the little o of one space, needs some amount of time. So obviously we cannot prove like great statements like uh, SAT is not in P, SAT requires polynomial time. But maybe we could prove SAT is not in L. So like if I assume you, um, you know, must use a tiny amount of space, like log space, or even n to the little of one space, Maybe then we could show some like lower bounds in the amount of time you need to solve SAT. Well, we didn't get polynomial time lower bounds, but he shows that any SAT algorithm using you know, less than linear space does need a fair bit of time. It needs uh, n to the 2 cos pi over 7 minus little of 1 time. Okay, that's very cute. Uh, this, is n, this is about n to the 1.8. Okay, this is the solution to some cubic equation. And I was on his PhD thesis committee, and I was like, the solution to that equation is 2 cos pi over 7. So he's like, great, I can write that instead. Um, and so we're going to prove a version of this. We won't prove this, but we'll probably get something like n to the 1.4 here. That's still cool. It's like noticeably bigger than linear. And to do that, you need uh, both 2a and 2b. <laughs> so it's, you know, in order to, you know, prove this theorem, you know, this is one reason why we're talking about 2a and 2b and so forth today. Now, actually, uh, in the middle of this result, when they got this up to n to the golden ratio, which is like n to the 1.6, uh, an embarrassing thing happened, which is that they proved this, uh, this middle group of authors proved this result, and everybody thought that was very cool. And then uh, Rahul Santanam came along and said, well, uh, I'm sorry to report that in 1984, and in some sense even in the 70s, uh, Durer and Galil proved a result that's like better than this. And it was like, 25 years ago, and it used like totally trivial technology, not totally trivial technology, but like very old fashioned technology. They showed that like palindromes, if you use sublinear space, needs uh, quadratic time. So uh, that it was like, oh, I thought we were proving something cool here. And then it turns out like with some like highly old fashioned technology, you can prove something better. But, aha, there's a happy ending <laughs> of a sort to the story. So uh, this heavily relies on multi-tape Turing machines. 
Okay, it's like a ramp up of like this very classical result that like to solve palindromes on a one tape Turing machine, you need quadratic time. And that's because Turing machines, one tape Turing machines really suck. Like you have to go back and forth and back and forth. And like even multi tape Turing machines still kind of suck. And like you can show this using just an elaboration of these arguments that like the tape has to go back and forth and back and forth, the head has to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But this one, da -da -da, it holds also for RAMs. You know, random access machines, which are kind of like the algorithmic model we really, really work in when we do algorithms. In other words, the fact that this is true, and this, of course, needs one. So, um, so that's good in the sense that like this result seems to genuinely be telling us something about like computation because it's about the model that we actually care about. Whereas this one is telling us that Turing machines are kind of stupid. <laughs> so. That's good, and you know, okay, to get that, they also needed one. Yes? Why do we not do everything in RAMs? This seems way nice. Uh, well, uh, it's because of exactly the Cook Levin theorem, which we will now talk about. You know, how do you prove the Cook Levin theorem? Like, you know, in an undergrad class, you're like, well, you draw the tableau. So then it's particularly convenient that it's a one tape Turing machine, although having multi tape is not so bad. And you say, oh, computation is local, so that like if your head's here, you only need to look up these cells above it in the tableau to like finish the job. But RAMs are not local. So that's tricky. Like, how do you even prove the, the Cook Levin theorem for RAMs? Or show that if you have a polynomial time algorithm of RAM that has polynomial size circuits? Have to think about it. It's not like incredibly hard, but let's think about that now. So let me talk a little bit about bullet point one. It's a good question. Actually, some people do. Like, I think when Dieter van Malkebeek, uh, is a well known complexity theorist, teaches his like, rad complexity course, he's like, our official model is the random access Turing machine. And then some parts of things take more work, some parts of things take less work. Let's talk briefly about RAMs versus TMs. Brian. Yeah. Sorry, just as a sanity check, you can solve palindromes in like near constant space and linear time in the RAM model, right? Uh, even in the, oh, good, in the RAM model? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can solve it in logarithmic space or constant space, depending on how exactly you define the RAM model and linear time by the, like, the obvious algorithm that, like, everybody really has in their head and uses for palindrome, right? Like, you have a pointer to the beginning, the pointer to the end, you check that they're the same, you move your pointers inwards, always checking. So it's linear time, and the amount of space you need is, like, log n bits to index your pointers. Okay, well, a one tape Turing machine cannot do that. Um, and, uh, yeah. Wait a minute. Ah, oh, yeah. A, uh, a two-tape Turing machine can do it in, like, you know, linear time, but it needs linear space. Because the thing you do is, like, take your input and, like, copy it in reverse to the second tape. But then you used up linear space. Okay. So, as, you know, let's, perhaps you believe, you know, it's not like RAMs are amazing, super amazing or anything. If you have a time t RAM, you can convert it to a time poly t, in fact, t squared, without much effort, multi-tape Turing machine. Uh, take my word for it, it's not too hard. And that's the best thing that's known. So we don't know if you can get it down to t log t time. That's an open problem. And that's a shame for like the whole idea of quasi-linear equals efficient. And uh, the difficulty, which I'll very briefly elaborate on, is uh, the dictionary data structure. So it's a data structure issue, seemingly. So what does a RAM do that's like tough for a Turing machine? Um, you know, it has these instructions that like, oh, I put in the array into cell 1047, 259. And then I do some stuff, and then I extract, you know, the 511th element of the array, and then, you know, maybe I set AX to be some other number, and so forth. So a RAM can do that. And that's kind of hard for a Turing machine because it doesn't, uh, with, you know, tape heads, because it doesn't have random access memory. So the logical thing to do, right, is to, you know, store, like, all the memory cells that the RAM has in, like, a dictionary data structure, like some kind of, you know, you have a key, which is like the address, and like a value, which is the entry, okay? And try to just store this. And so you say, okay, like, 
if I just want it quasi-linear, I don't have to go crazy with data structures. Like maybe I can just use like, I don't know, a balanced binary search tree to like implement the dictionary data structure. Well, much like the issue with like binary sort, like it's not clear how to do this efficiently on a multi-tape Turing machine because you know, <laughs> representing trees in memory, you start moving things around and like you know you use random access. So that's a problem. Uh, but uh, here's something that is done by Gravich and Shella, which is pretty cool. We've seen like a kind of trick like this before. Um, they noticed that a non-deterministic uh, time t RAM can be simulated by a non-deterministic time uh, quasi-linear, in fact, t log t Turing machine. So like you can do this simulation very efficiently if you upgrade yourself to non-determinism. And that's what we're actually caring about in this context. And how do you do that? Let me not write anything, but I'll say some words that you can think about. This is also like an interesting exercise. Uh, OK. So how do you, let's say you have a non-deterministic time t RAM. You still have non-determinism yourself in the simulation, so that's not the issue. It's like, how do you like, I don't know, do this data structure? Well, the first thing the simulator does is it guesses like all the sequences of memory reads and writes that the computation is going to do. And then it's going to start the simulation and check that its guesses are consistent with what it, uh, actually happens. Now, it has to do another thing, which is check that the guessed sequences of reads and writes to memory are like consistent with themselves in the sense that like when you eventually read like you know, uh, you know, entry 259, and you guessed that you got back 25. Uh, you have to check that, like, the last plot time you wrote to like that entry 259, you like wrote a 25. So you have to check that this like sequence of memory reads and writes is like logically internally self-consistent, which you can do if you think about it by sorting it like primarily by time and secondarily by uh, position. So you can do that deterministically by sorting. And so that's how you pull this off. And like the key trick is again, you like guess all the memory reads and writes at the beginning. Yeah? One question for conundrums. Um, Could we just like copy the square root of, um, of m chunks to, uh, to the same table of time and check them? Where am I going to go wrong? Mm. Like we, we, we could just uh, divide the, the input into square root of m chunks mm -hmm. and then uh, copy them onto, onto the tape and, uh, and check them at a time. And in my head, it sounds like that should be uh, n to the uh, one half. Your running time will be n to the one point five. Yeah. Uh, it should be. Maybe, yeah, I, I couldn't. I conflated two results in my head here. One thing that's definitely true is it's known that like, okay, this fact was definitely proved for sure by Santanam in 2011. That if you want to solve SAT in sublinear time, or sublinear space, it needs near quadratic time. And he kind of did it based on ideas from this like palindrome stuff. There also are time space lower bounds for palindromes on multi tape Turing machines, and they might be something like space times time has to always be at least n squared, uh, which is kind of consistent with what you were saying. Uh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, that's fine. So, wait, I'm, I got confused myself. Here I'm only allocating n to the little o of one time, or a space. So, you can, you, I, that your solution required root n space. But here, I'm, you know, I'm not even giving you n to the point 0.01 space. You know, you can think of polylog here if you want. Yeah. yeah, good, yeah. So more generally for palindromes, this is known. Space times time has to be at least n squared. Good. OK. So uh, the cool thing is that um, this shows that um, non-deterministic quasi-linear time is highly model insensitive. 
which is like we, nice. We really like when our, 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 you know, our, our complexity classes are insensitive to what like model you use. And there's other variants besides RAM and so forth. But like a cool fact is that like in the non-deterministic case, like quasi-linear time on this model is the same as on that model and so forth. Um, good. So that means that if you want to do Cook 11, like you know, for um, RAM, you'll only lose like a log. And so then if you can do the main part of Cook 11 with like T log T, then overall you'll get uh, a size blow up or running time blow up of T log squared T, which is fine. In fact, a guy called Robson in 91 like got that log squared down to log and like people were happy about that. But let's say like we're going <laughs> to relax a little bit and not care about the exponent in our n times poly log n algorithms. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so I kind of talked about this one, which is good. So now I'm going to talk about bullet point two. I should mention another uh, result that I hope to get to is Williams's recent circuit lower bounds, ACC circuit lower bounds for NEXP. And like those bounds also heavily rely on like 2A and 2B. So again, this is another reason why I'm going through this like somewhat technical topic today. that we never have to do it again. OK, so let's review uh, Cook Levin, the proof of it. OK, so uh, remember, we're reducing non-deterministic time t to sat on formulas of size poly t, and ideally maybe t log t, or something like that. So let um, M be uh, n time t machine. Okay, and uh, you know, let's just say without loss of generality on input x of size n, uh, M uses t of n, you know, guess bits. It only has t of n time, so we just at every time step it can like guess one bit and record it. Uh, and let's assume that it gets them uh, y from a separate tape. So instead of imagine that like it internally like you know flips coins, let's just assume we give it like the guess bits on like an external tape y. Okay, so in other words, we can think of m now as having two inputs, like x, the like real input of length n, and y, the, like, the non-deterministic uh, bits. Or like in the, the randomized viewpoint, the, the random bits. And uh, what does the cook levin theorem do? It's really the same as the, the proof that like every polynomial time algorithm can be converted into a poly-sized circuit. Um, so this reduction, R, that we're trying to build, takes x. And it's supposed to output, let's say, if we're going to circuit set. Uh, a circuit which is satisfiable if and only if uh, m, on run, when run with x, has the property that there exists a y that makes this thing accept. So basically, you know, we use this p and p slash poly idea to build like a circuit, which I'm going to draw downward, which, uh, first of all, it kind of has like x hard coded in here. Okay. So when you're just proving p's and p slash poly, like that's it. There's nothing else. You just have this circuit that has x hard coded in and gives the output. Uh, but like, it also has its inputs like the y part, which are kind of free. I mean, these are like actual inputs to the circuit. Okay, so it's this is all the Tableau stuff goes in here. You know, simulating the computation Tableau of M with a circuit. Okay, and so this is some circuit C sub X of Y. Like it depends, it, like X is hard coded into the circuit, but Y is the real inputs. And like the proof is that this thing is in circuit sat, you know, that the computations here are the same. So therefore this is in, let's say circuit sat, if and only if, you know, uh, there exists Y such that M of X, Y accepts. Okay, so that's the proof of Cook Levin in a nutshell. Okay.
Okay, so um, now let's look at the question 2a that we asked ourselves. You know, in, in undergraduate complexity, you just say, if this is polynomial time, then this is polynomial size. We're being a little bit greedier. And it's just there's good news. Like, remember I told you, like, we discussed this a couple lectures ago, like, all this stuff, like, hart monisterns K-tape to two-tape, or, like, reduction in algorithm. It's like Pippinger, Fisher, like, take a, uh, take a Turing machine and make it oblivious. Um, you know, like all this stuff, like the, the tape reduction and the obliviousness, means that if you stick it all into this proof, you can get that the size of the circuit can be uh, order t of n log t of n. Okay, and that's great. That's like what we wanted for and what we wanted in 2a. Okay, because we, as we saw when we were, you know, going from time t Turing machines to size the circuits, if you put in all this stuff, that's Aurora Barak has it if you care, you can make the circuit size t log t. Uh, so 2a is done. And uh, 1 plus 2a is also done because you can first convert your you know, uh, RAM machine to a multi-tape Turing machine at the cost of a log factor and then like get another log factor here. So as I said, you can get t log squared t. Um, it's not so clear how to make this, uh, yeah. Okay, never mind. Great. Okay, so what about this last question I want to ask about, 2B? And uh, what we're going to do for the rest of the class is I'll, I'll tell you some stuff about 2B to assure you that like everything you want to be true is true, and then we'll end by proving this theorem. Okay, so what do we need for 2b? We kind of need that in Cook 11, this mapping from, it's really a mapping actually from x, where m is considered fixed. This mapping from x to this circuit is not just, well, we showed that you can make a small circuit, a t log t size circuit. It's not that just you can compute it efficiently, but you can compute it like hyper efficiently. Like, if I give you x and also like uh, index i and ask the question like what is the ith bit of the representation of the circuit, you can even solve that like super efficiently. That's what we want. And uh, basically I talked about this last Thursday. So like when we talked about the p slash poly stuff, you know the p and p slash poly stuff, I said that it, you could do it like in this d log time uniform way. Which really said that like this uh, this reduction is not just computable efficiently, but like um, in this like hyper efficient way where you can output any part of this thing in polylog time. And we skipped that as well, but that's just the fact that like really this this uh, tableau business is like super regular. I mean, this is like a very trivially structured circuit. So just a little bit of arithmetic can tell you like the description of any piece of this circuit as a function of x. Okay, so because of that, uh, you know, we can get 2a together with 2b. In fact, let me just mention that in 2014, uh, Emanuele Viola and a couple of his students showed that like, not only can you do this, compute this reduction r in polylog time, you can actually do it, which is kind of like logarithmic parallel time. You can even do it in like constant parallel time. So like. You can do this reduction ridiculously efficiently, which is nice. Okay, so like it's not hard to get 1 and 2a together. And we know that you can get 2a and 2b together. And so then maybe if you really want like everything to all together, um, what are you going to do? Uh, there's a slight hitch, which is that, you know, the fact that this reduction R is like super efficient and like super easily and this circuit is highly structured is partly due to the fact that you can make this computation oblivious. But um, the RAM to TM reduction 
that I talked about with the dictionary data structure, you know, implemented non-deterministically is not obviously obliviousable. <laughs> But I'll set that up and just strike it down immediately to say that, like, well, if you work a little bit harder, you can do it. So, so the first person to do this was a guy called Giannis Terlakis in 2001. I know him quite well because, like, we sat next to each other in, like, the University of Toronto undergrad version of, like, 455. Um, he went on to prove this great fact, which made a lot of people happy. And then... Um, it was sort of reproved uh, by a couple of people, and uh, Dieter van Malkebeek, I guess I mentioned also, he kind of had like a nicer write-up of this proof that you can find. It's kind of nice in the sense that like, it doesn't go through oblivious Turing machines, it kind of goes straight from RAMs to um, Cook 11. So it, it evades obliviousness by virtue of the fact that you have non-determinism. Okay, so... This is sort of the final check mark, like everything that you could possibly dream of for the Cook Levin theorem is true. And let me add like one more like remark, um, which is that I've been always talking about going to circuits at, reducing to circuits at. Uh, but you know, it's even better to reduce to oops sat if you can help it, because well, sat's a simpler problem, so it's like cooler to know that you can even reduce to sat. It's even better to reduce to 3SAT if you can help it, because again, this is a special case of this, so it's better to reduce to it. But if you think about it for like one second, the textbook reduction from circuit SAT to 3SAT is ridiculously trivial. So like this reduction is like very trivial. You know, it's just that thing where like you introduce a variable for each gate, and then you just have to check that like the variable's value is consistent with, the gate's value is consistent with the incoming gate's value. So that's like a size 3 clause or 2. Okay, so this is all like just adds constant factors everywhere. So you can get all this glorious stuff even when reducing from n time t to uh, three set formulas. So be size t poly log t, and you can compute them ridiculously efficiently, et cetera. Yep? What do we mean by the RAM t reduction is not of the view? I don't want to get into it too much. Um, I guess the problem is that. Uh, you want a RAM to multi-tape Turing machine reduction that only loses polylog factors. The DM, like oblivification thing, yeah. also introduces only an extra log, right? So yeah. So what do I mean? What is the issue that they have to overcome here? Honestly, I did not look into this super carefully when I was preparing the lecture. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, at the spot, I can no longer think about it. It made sense to me at the time when I was like preparing the lecture, but now I cannot remember. Uh, I'll put. I'll post to Piazza. It's a good question. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so that's the last I want to discuss about uh, these issues. And uh, now let me turn to proving one theorem, which is a nice theorem to know, which is that the succinct SAT problem is complete for non-deterministic exponential time. And that's a useful fact to know, uh, just because, you know, it's nice to have a nice complete problem for NEXP. And, uh, you know, for this Williams theorem that, like, NEXP does not have small size circuits of a certain type, like, the very first step is you say, like, let's take, let's use the fact that succinct SAD is complete for NEXP and show that it does not have small size circuits. And uh, you'll see also, like, why 2B is important. The fact that the, the Cook 11 reduction is, like, poly log time. Okay, so where am I here? Okay. Right, so application of 2B is the theorem that uh, succinct 
that is next complete. Okay, so let me define a few things here. Uh, let me elaborate a little bit on this succinct notion. So in fact, uh, given any language L, uh, you can define succinct L, a new language, um, which is like the language of all encodings of circuits, such that the truth table of the circuit is in L. Okay, so if this is a circuit with like n input bits, and this is a two to the n length string. Yep. Succinct L harder than succinct L. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you can. If I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure it's true that like you know you can, for example, show that succinct succinct sad is complete for non-deterministic doubly exponential time. I, I believe so. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's true. Okay, and so what is the point of this? Uh, it's slightly funnily stated, but it's. It's like, it's like the same succinct L is sort of like you're still trying to answer whether or not X is in L, but X is somehow succinctly given. Meaning that you don't just get X and like get to see it. You kind of get the ability to answer questions like, um, you know, what is the ith bit of X? So the ith bit of X is, you know, computable or gettable in poly encoding size of i time. Okay? So like if you think of x as an n bit or an m bit string, this is like poly log m. Okay, that's what's uh, that's what's really going on here. Like c is succinctly encoding a string. Yep? Um, when you say it's complete, do you mean it's complete under like exponential time reduction or all still under time reduction? Good, yeah. yeah. Under poly time reductions. <laughs> Good question. Okay, so this is a funny concept, uh, but it's a, it's a nice concept actually. And just to connect it a little bit back to some things you know, let's imagine this uh, language when L is a very, very simple language. It's the language OR. In other words, it's all the strings X such that X uh, contains a one. It's a very simple problem. It's in P. It's in um, it's a regular language. Uh, but what is succinct L? Somebody say? Yeah, it's circuit side. Okay, so this like succinctification is kind of a way to take like a natural language and like make a related natural language that's somehow like exponentially harder or something. Can you explain again this? Why, why is this in the L is so uh, So according to the definition, what is the, what is, what is the meaning of the language succinct OR? The input is a circuit and you're trying to decide if the truth table of the circuit is in the OR language. So you're trying to decide if the truth table of the circuit has a one in it. Right, which is circuit side, right? I give you a circuit and you want to know is there an input that makes the output one? Yeah? You don't need to cover all the strings in L? You cannot. No, okay, so this is, maybe I'll say something here which may answer your question. So uh, there's some boring stuff when you like start to talk about this. Like typically for like a natural L, you assume some kind of appropriate encoding for it. Like, okay, when the case when L is the OR function, you don't really need to do anything. But like, you know, uh, you want to say that like, uh, like one issue here, right, is that like, um, in the version of succinct L, you're, you somehow are only considering strings of whether or not they're in L for strings of lengths that are like a power of two. And like maybe due to a way you encode your problem L, like maybe a natural way of encoding the three set problem happens to have the property that every input when naturally encoded has length a multiple of three. And then, you know, it'll never have length two to the n. 
Okay, so you have to like care about this issue, but like nothing interesting uh, really goes on. Um, but so, uh, for example, you want that like you know x is always equivalent in terms of being in the language or not to some string of length the power of two. So for example, like if you can just take your language and like allow padding, so like you have an instance and you also allow it to like junk on the end, which doesn't affect what you care about. So like every input can be padded to a power of two. Oh, then you have to worry about like, oh, but how do you do that with like zeros and ones? So you have to take the input and maybe like double each character so it's zero, zero, or one, one. And so you can pad with zero ones. Like it's very boring, but like don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so for example, like, it's convenient to define succinctness. I mean, this is a very like elegant definition. Like, you know, the succinct version is like, I give you a circuit, is its truth table in the language. But really, I mean, don't get like superly overly caught up on like encoding issues. Um, people more generally, you know, think of let's say succinct sat as just, you know, you have some natural way of like succinctly encoding a sat problem, and you want to, you know, decide it. Okay, so like succinct three sat, like uh, let me assure you, um, you know, you can reduce it in polynomial time and it's reducible in polynomial time to like a variant where you're given a circuit C and uh, representing a formula phi succinctly in the sense that like, you know, C if you give it I outputs the ith clause of phi. Okay, maybe this is like a slightly nicer way to like formulate the succinct three set problem. Like it give you a circuit and you can like ask for the million trillionth uh, clause that of the formula it represents where a million trillion is written in binary and it tells you the three variables that appear in that clause. Okay, that's not quite the same as this but if you have some boring encoding issues, you can pass back and forth between them. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. I'm still struggling to like, uh, figure out what the truth table looks like. Could you explain, like, given some very simple circuit, how you would like, write out the truth table? Just means like if you have a circuit C with like three inputs and one output, like you just write down. So like x, c of x, and then like this has some, I mean c has some values on each of these strings, perhaps like this, and so like this, uh, by this string 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, I mean the truth table of c. So like each circuit c with n inputs has a truth table which is a string of length 2 to the n. Okay, maybe what I'll say uh, just now will also help a little bit. So you know, I want to show that succinct sat is complete for next. Let me show the easy part first, which is that it's in next. Okay, so it's like you got a sat formula. You have a sat formula. You want to show if it understand if it's satisfiable or not. That sounds like an NP problem, but the issue is you don't really have it. You have the ability to like find out the bits of it's. You know, it's, it's somehow like an implicitly represented exponential size formula. So you have the ability to like, in some sense, query the bits, uh, the representation of the formula efficiently. So what is the proof of this? Well, indeed, like, let me just say as a remark in the beginning of the proof, you know, for any L in NP, uh, succinct L is in next. Okay. Or, for example, for any L that's in P, succinct L is in X. So, can somebody say the idea of the proof? Yeah? Uh, probably just query all the exponential many things and then actually write out the formula and then guess the position. That's right. Yeah. So, you just, you have exponential time, so like, you know, just given as input CN, you know, in exponential time, like, you know, compute its truth table. 
Don't do anything special, just like literally write it all down, try to go over all inputs to C of n, compute the output, you get the truth table. It's an exponential length string, but that's fine. And then, then you solve the problem, sad in this case. So like using non-determinism, you know, guess and check. So I guess do this and then like interpret it as the encoding of some formula phi, guess and check a satisfying assignment for a phi. Okay, so you use exponential time, you use non-determinism, you use exponentially many non-deterministic guess bits. It's fine. Any questions about this? Okay. So the last thing I'll show is that uh, so think that is uh, next part. So every language in next can be reduced in polynomial time to succinct that. And I'll do this proof and like you'll squint to the proof and be like somehow like nothing happened. Like it's like <laughs> it's like you use Cook Levin with like 2B, the super efficient thing, and then yeah, it's like yeah. Like it won't be somehow revelatory. It's sort of it follows from 2B and just like understanding everything that's going on. So it will not be like the greatest punchline, but let me just put it up there anyway and then we'll be done. Okay, so the main theorem is that um, thing psi is next part under polynomial time reductions. Okay, and let me just as another remark that it's basically like a more, in some ways like a more general version of the statement. And I won't be super precise, but basically if you have two languages A and B, and A reduces to B in polylong time, then succinct A reduces in polynomial time to succinct B. But let me just make that comment and then go back to what we want to prove. Okay, so uh, let's do the proof. What do we, let me just write down what we want to show. We want to show that for all languages L in NEXP, uh, L reduces in polynomial time to succinct set. I can even put three set here. Let me do that. Okay, so let's just start unpacking the definition. So by assumption, okay, like let's take an L, uh, given L, by assumption there exists a non-deterministic machine M running in time T of N, which is two to the N to the constant C, deciding L. So now let me draw the picture of what we need to design. What we need is like a reduction that takes an x of length n, and then let me call the reduction script x or script r, uh, running in poly uh, n time. And syntactically, what kind of object should it output? A circuit, right. So it should output a circuit because it's trying to output like an instance of the succinct three set problem. And an instance of a succinct three set problem is a circuit, a circuit describing a formula. Uh, okay, such that if x is in L, well, x is in L if and only if. C of x is in succinct three side. Okay, like that is the translation of this statement that we're trying to prove. Okay. So just to remember what these things mean, right? This means that there exists a y, and the length of y now could be like two to the n to the c, such that this Turing machine m on real input x and like kind of guess bits y. 
uh, accept. And what does this mean? It kind of means that uh, phi of x, which is like the truth table of this circuit, is in 3 sat. Okay, so it's a further expansion of the definitions. Okay, so basically, without you know worrying too much about all the definitions, uh, it's like Cook-Levin, right? I mean, we have a uh, machine. This one happens to be like exponential time, but anyway, um, and it's a non-deterministic machine. We're trying to like encode its computation, like you know, it's, it's a computation tableau or whatever, by like a formula phi. So, you know, Cook Levin together with 2B kind of tells us we can do that in like a, a hyper-efficient way. So, you know, say as we've seen, you know, there exists a reduction R running in time polylog, but polylog in the time parameter, which is 2 to the n to the C which this is as we've seen regarding 2b, which produces, well, with Cook Levin, we always talked about reducing to a circuit sat problem, but then at one point I said, oh, you can further reduce to 3 sat. So think of it as producing like a 3 sat formula. Phi of x, you know, depending on x and like where the variables here kind of stand for the the, the guess bits, y, of size, well, it can even be quasi-linear in this, so I don't know, 2 to the n to the c, polylog 2 to the n to the c, uh, which is whatever, 2 to the order n to the c, such that x is in L if and only if phi x is in 3 set. And let me just comment here that like the fact that we had, you know, t log t here is kind of what we were talking about in 2a. We actually didn't need that. You know, it would have been fine if this is the size blob was polynomial. Like this is going to be, the 2b thing is going to be the key player here. The fact that this reduction runs in, this is poly n time. For this problem, we don't care too much about the size of the formula that's implicitly produced. So like the plainest version of Cook Levin would just say like there's this reduction R that outputs this formula that's equivalent to the x equals L question in L question explicitly. But now with this 2B version, we're saying you can kind of produce it implicitly. So what does this, you know, producing it mean? That's a funny arrow, but I decided to switch boards. And this is going to be the part of the proof where you're like, what? So there's like so many symbols and like letters and like what's going on, but we're almost done. Uh, what does it mean? It means that like the, the this quote unquote producing means that the, you know, i bit of the encoding of phi x is computable. in poly size of the encoding of i time. Okay, this is an exponential size formula, so like i ranges up to an exponential number, uh, but the size of its encoding is the log of that, which is polynomial. So even I had to ask myself, so wait, like, are we done? Did, is that it? Uh, there's somehow not, still not quite it, right? Because this R, well, you know, Latin R is somehow not quite the same thing as this script R. Uh, right? Like S R is like this efficient algorithm that can like take I and tell you like the ith bit of like 
the final answer that you're trying to implicitly represent. But like syntactically, right, like script R computes a circuit. So what's going on? You should take the R and transform it to the circuit like using loop level Yeah, yeah. So like so like R is R is a polytime algorithm. Right? So therefore it has poly size circuit families. Because you know P is contained in P slash poly. And uh, even P uniform ones, right? So like not only since R is a polynomial time algorithm, not only does it have polynomial circuit size circuit families, but like you can compute those circuits in polynomial time. And uh, so like this is basically where script R comes in. Okay, so script R is like the algorithm that computes the circuit that does R's computation. Right? So like R is the thing that's, R is like an algorithm that like implicitly describes a, f a formula. And uh, you know, you're supposed to output like a circuit. So well, polynomial time algorithms have polynomial size circuits and like script R's job is to like construct that. Yeah, so let's just say the end. <laughs> um, I mean, that, that is it, but like it is, I want to do this like kind of like a technical lecture. Um, so the summary, if, if you will, is that so think three sat is in the next part by virtue of the fact that Cook-Levin theorem is not only true, but has like these super efficient quasi-linear polylog time versions. And um, that's a good fact to know. Uh, you know, this is a, a good fact to know in life, having a natural next complete problem. And the other good fact to sort of remember and take away from this, I think, is just that SAT is uh, complete for non-deterministic quasi-linear time. So um, every problem in non-deterministic time can be like very efficiently reduced to SAT. So that questions about whether you can do SAT in time 2 to the n to the 0.99, or does it really require 2 to the n time, you have the matching like equivalent question about any kind of non-deterministic problem. Yeah. So does this mean that to show succinct, succinct, three set is next, next part, we would need a cook levin theorem that ran in poly log log time or something like that? No, I don't think so. I don't think you can have someone that's running in poly log log time. I think it's just like, you'll need like a th three dimensional version of this blackboard. Like, you know, kind of, you'll do like the whole picture or your, twice or something. I didn't have the heart to look into it. Oh, okay. um, sure. But like, you'll just, uh, you, you won't have like a poly log log time cook leaven. I think that's not possible. But you'll just have to iterate this argument. Okay. It's very annoying, right? You have like a circuit whose truth table describes a circuit whose truth table describes a formula. Yeah. Okay, see you on Tuesday. <laughs>